Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for making the early start. It's fantastic to see so many people here. And on that note, um, I'd like to, to issue a small apology, but not a, not a, a full apology, for the time of this event. Um, it, was a, it was a slightly impromptu addition to this summit because I've had a number of conversations recently, particularly with um, people in the UK, in the light of new laws here on gender pay gap reporting. And this uh, new law has led to a lot of conversations in the, in the profession about how we can close that gap. And of course, that gap relates to the number of senior women in the industry, which is much smaller than I think we would like it to be. So this morning, we want to shine a bit of a spotlight uh, on this issue of how we can retain more women in the sector, in the profession. Uh, and we took the opportunity of a, of a diverse summit audience to, uh, to kick off this debate. And we hope this will be one of a number of such sessions and the others will be held at different times of day so that we can include as many people uh, over the next few months in this, on this issue. So thank you very much for, for making the effort delighted to see a wide audience. This is absolutely not just for women. It's very much for men and women to look at these challenges and come up with, hopefully, some great solutions. So we've got a fantastic panel chaired by Amanda Clack, who, as many of you will know, was our last president at RICS and now um, a senior executive director at CBRE. So, Amanda, over to you. Thank you very much, Gillian, and good morning, everybody. Um, I have a very slight apology to make, which is that we're just waiting for one of our panellists um, who's stuck in traffic, but she's five minutes away, and that was five minutes ago, so she should literally be here any minute. We thought we would start because we're conscious that we will finish <coughs> at 10 to 9 to make sure that you're all ready, can grab a coffee and get to the first ses session. Um, I have a fantastic panel with me this morning. Um, to my left, your right, um, first of all, is Simon Pritchard, who's the senior partner at Gerald Eve. In addition, Simon actually is the chair of the Windsor Group, and we'll hear a little bit more about what that is um, shortly. Um, to his left um, on your right is Bryony Day, as we know her, as the Women of the Future winner, now Bryony Goldsmith, um, who is an associate at Arcadis and was a winner of Women of the Future. And then joining her um, on her left again, your right, um, will be Vicky Smith, who's a partner at Deloitte. So um, a really great panel um, to kind of start the conversation off. So why have we got this subject, I think, is the first thing to say. Well, first of all, 14% of qualified members in our ICS are female. And when you look at the number of trainees, it's actually a slightly better statistic, which is 21%. But I think we all believe, and I know when Louise was president, we really kind of kicked off this agenda in terms of trying to address particularly diversity and inclusion. But we have to do more to attract top talent into the profession. And I think where we are at the moment is we believe that the C-suite absolutely get the issues. And when you look at those people that are actually coming in at grassroots level, so trainees and graduates and apprentices, um, they want to work in organisations that are taking diversity and inclusion seriously. So if we know what the issues are, I think it's really important that we don't focus on those issues per se, but really focus on what actions we now need to be taking to address the issues. And I think it's very important to actually be action-oriented um, in terms of what we're doing. Um, the Inclusive Employer Quality Mark was launched during Louise's presidency. We now have 150 firms covering 150,000 employees um, actually signed up and part of that Inclusive Employer Quality Mark, which is fantastic. And for me, that's actually about starting to really change the dial. Um, the other um, standard that's around is the National Equality Standard and actually CBRE are really proud to have been one of the first real estate advisors along with some of the clients in real estate, so M&G and Lendlease for example that have got that as well. And I think these standards are important in terms of actually saying that organisations are state starting to take this agenda seriously. And the building inclusivity laying the foundations for the future report um, really was the first report of the sector by the sector. Um, for those of you that haven't seen it, I recommend it as a read. It really starts to look at this issue and it came out quite clearly within it 
that the key point is how do we retain that top talent. Um, so if we're starting to look at the attraction, um, we're starting to see perhaps as a start to change in particularly at the C-suite level, now we really need to start to think about what is it in that middle mid-career area that we can start to do differently. So the key issue is really about how do we start to retain and develop that female talent um, mid-career. So this session is very much about how do we keep women in property and construction. So I'm going to come to Simon first of all. Um, I mentioned the Windsor Group. The Windsor Group is basically the chief executives of the major um, real estate and um, property firms coming together um, to really talk about how they can collaborate and do things differently. Um, the Windsor Group, I think, is setting an agenda um, around diversity and inclusion. I know it's been very much on, on your agenda as chair, Simon. What's the mood from that group in terms of the action that should be taking? And perhaps also, what are Gerald Eve doing in this space? What action are you taking? I'm not allowed to talk about the Windsor Group. That's, it's a sort of secret, secret group, a sort of... Oops. <laughs> um, well, what it is, I suppose, is a, is a general practice group rather than the sort of wider construction area of, of the major firms and, and the top 10 firms in general practice uh, by, by virtue of turnover. Um, we, we, uh, why it's called the Windsor Group, it originally met in Windsor some sort of 15, 20 years back. I, I've been involved with the group for about five years. I've chaired it for the last two years. And actually, in, in certainly in the five years I've been involved with the Windsor Group, I've noticed uh, a remarkable change. And, and it's part of the issue that I think we, we face today, which is just generational. So as younger uh, senior partners and chief execs have, have entered that group, you, you have seen a very sort of changing attitude, particularly, I think, to, to, um, towards women in the workplace. Um, a great example, um, and I'm not going to mention names, but I, I do recall one of my first Windsor Group sessions where, you know, we had the sort of gender initiative sort of front and central as a debate, and a very senior figure in the industry about five years ago when we were talking about retaining female talent after the second child in particular, so late 30s perhaps age-wise, early 40s, he just said, what's the point? And, and that attitude five, six years ago has been replaced with how do we, how do we make our respective firms um, more friendly, more inviting? How do we create additional flexibility? Um, how do we get behind initiatives like the changing face of property? How do we, and, and, and all of this stuff is, is, is relatively new. So for me, a, a, a big aspect of the debate is, is, is generational. I, I'm, I'm not here to defend how men have behaved for the last 2,000 years towards women, um, because I can't simply, and I'm, I'm also not the enemy. But, but what I have, I have witnessed in, in the last five years is an appreciable change at the top of the major firms to, to putting the, the gender initiative and also the social diversity initiative at the top of the agenda. So when the Windsor Group meet, we don't sit around, smoke cigars, um, talk about collusion, anti-competitive behaviour and, and fees. This, this, this agenda, retaining talent, the war for talent, female talent, diversity, is absolutely front and central. In terms of um, my own practice, 10 years ago, so sort of 06, 07, I was doing a lot of work with, with JP Morgan, actually, just around, around the corner in Canary Wharf. And I'd watched how they had embraced sort of different groups within society. Particularly, they had sort of sought, sought out the pink dollar or, or the grey pound. And they'd been really, really successful at identifying groups that, that perhaps mainstream organisations had missed. And when I looked at our industry in my own firm, it, 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 it was chronically short of, of talented women. And we, 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 in 06, 07, financial crisis, we sat down as a board and we came up with a 10-point plan. And about number three on our sort of pillars of what we're going to do was that we would seek to be the employer of choice in, in the general practice arena for female talent coming out of the universities. So we had a, a very um, sort of active uh, campaign 
to, to proactively recruit the best female talent um, coming out of universities at that time. And the, I, I'm not saying others weren't doing it. I just think we were slightly ahead of the curve. And I'd like to think it was because I was being sort of, you know, altruistic and it was for all the right reasons. It was partially commercial. I saw it as an absolute commercial advantage that I could attract the top females in, into our practice. And I, and I thought that would give us uh, an edge over the competition. So it was, it was a combination of, of two thoughts 10 years ago. And we were very successful um, at hoovering up um, a lot of the female talent, which thankfully is still with us sort of 10 years on. We, we now face a different set of, of, of challenges, as I've said, around, around how, how we deal with maternity, how we deal with career breaks, how we deal with retaining that talent in the business. And, and making the business welcoming. But I also think we probably as a practice benefited from, from, from work types. My, my business is, is quite consultative rather than brokerage focused. So work type was, was relevant, planning and development and, and rating, um, and less, less brokerage. And that's not in any way to say that, that my female colleagues can't do brokerage. And I think we've worked really hard to make the brokerage teams more welcoming, particularly sort of, you know, post, post children. So it's been a very deliberate and successful uh, initiative for us. And then just flipping back to the Windsor Group, what I can guarantee to you is that, that all the major firms through Changing Face of Property and their various sort of domestic initiatives do see this as, as almost sort of one, two, three priority in, in terms of the way that we are thinking. So um, yeah, we're, we're, we're right behind it. Great, thank you, Simon. And Bryony, as a winner of Women of the Future, um, really setting the aspiration of what kind of workplace you would like to see created that's supportive for women, and perhaps maybe some examples, if you can, from what Arcadis are doing. Yeah, so um, uh, I think as an industry, we were quite good at attracting, or we're starting to get better at attracting female talent. Um, and. Um, I remember being a graduate, I, I, I um, have been with Arcada since I graduated, as was E.C. Harris, um, and actually the support there um, across the board was fantastic and I never felt early in my career that there was ever any kind of unconscious bias in place. Um, I think it's only as you um, get to sort of the area that we're focusing on today, that kind of middle management space that you start to maybe notice that, that you're not quite peer to peer with your peers anymore. Um, and actually people that you thought were your peers um, were coming to you for advice. Um, so it, it's only when you kind of get further into that journey, I think, that you start to wake up, um, not so much wake up, but start to realise what the industry maybe used to be like. Um, and I think for me it's about creating an environment where everyone can be themselves and bring themselves to work. Um, I worked for a contractor before I... Um, before I joined Arcadis when I was at uh, university. Um, and that was great fun. Um, but I really felt like I had to become one of the lads <coughs> to be accepted, which was fine um, at that point, but it's not the sort of thing that you can keep up uh, for a very long time. Um, and so I believe that if we have a culture where people can really feel comfortable to be themselves at work, and we are all different, um, men, uh, women, you know, we're made differently. We can't, I don't think we can avoid the fact that we are different and we do respond to things in different ways. And there's certain traits that, that um, the different sexes have. Um, and I think we need to respect that. Um, but I think it's about creating, as I said, an environment where people feel comfortable to be able to, to um, sort of talk about their worries and their concerns and share their successes because um, that's ultimately what, what keeps us going. Um, I'm a big believer that everyone is in charge of their own careers, so no one's going to kind of lay the path for you um, and just watch you walk up it as such. Um, you really need to push for that. But I think if we can create working environments where we are encouraging everyone to, to be the best that they can be, um, then I think that's, somewhere, that, that's an environment that I want to be working in. Great. And Vicky, I know you shared with us when we were sort of doing a bit of a prep talk on this that you're a, you're a working mum. What sort of things have been put in place that you've seen that have worked to help support um, mums, mm. particularly in that mid-career? And what's worked for you? And maybe some good examples from Deloitte, if you can. 
Uh, and first of all, apologies for being late. Uh, very sorry about that. Um, in terms of um, being a working mother and any adaptations that's needed, I think it all comes back to having very honest and open conversations with your team. Um, and I was talking to one of my team yesterday who is about to go on maternity leave and we sat down and we had a very frank conversation and I said, you know, you're very good, I really want to retain you. You're going to go through a period of time when your outside environment is changing and we want to do what we can to help you and let's see what we can both do to work through that. But actually through the heart of that has got to be honest and open conversations around what do people want, what constraints have people got and what changes can we make to adapt to what those people's requirements and I've always been I don't think fortunate I've, but I've always worked with people who have been very supportive of the fact that I am a working mother and I say not fortunate because I think that should be the norm um, but my eldest child is 17 and when he was born 17 years ago the the environment was quite different in terms of people talking around returning mothers, adaptations, accommodating people's requirements. And when I um, left that employer about, about five years, ten years ago, I was there for about five years with my son, um, I said to the partner I worked for at the time, you've always been great. And he said, yeah, and you've always been great. We found a way of working together, working through it. Um, I've always known that if things got too difficult, you wouldn't stay. So I've wanted you to stay because you're good. And I've always known that you found other ways of wanting to make up time that you haven't been able to do, work around commitments. So I think it is, uh, you know, and at Deloitte, we have lots of programmes in place and lots of interventions to help people, all of which are very good. But I think all of those interventions only work if you have real commitment from the senior management that this is something they want to move forward and then on a day-to-day -day level you've got teams who are able to have those honest and open conversations so we do have we've got a return to work program we've got um, transition programs for people coming back from maternity leave where um, their managers go on training alongside the team alongside the team members to work out how best to make the adaptations to come up with a joint plan and all of those things are are great but I think they are all underpinned by the fact that we've got a culture where people want to support people with any type of outside commitment whether it's children or other outside commitments and it's something that we are measured on it's something that we are very focused on so I think you need lots of different pieces you know you need high level support you need some interventions you need open and honest conversations at a working level and, and I'd like to sort of like build on that a little bit so I think C-suite get it as we say that the next generation really kind of they know what they want and they'll look for firms that have basically are going to provide a supportive environment but what's the deal in the middle management what sort of things because it came out through um, certainly the building inclusivity report which was it kind of goes wrong in terms of that middle management support and you talked about this deal Vicky about effectively having open conversations and the deal that you make as an individual with your employer but what support can we be looking at to put in place around um, perhaps those line managers that sit in the middle and they're thinking what do I do what's the best way to support people mid-career so, so what we do at Deloitte is everyone who has a team member who's going on maternity leave or parental leave, uh, the manager goes on training in terms of, so the manager understands what the firm's policies are, understands best, best practice and the team member goes on a similar training course. Both are put in touch with networks so they can, so as people going off out of the business for a period of time they can spent time with other people who've done that and returned successfully and learn from them and similarly their managers are put in touch with people who've managed people successfully back into the business so there are lots of interventions yeah. to make it work but then I still think it comes down to having individual honest conversations. Bryony Simon any comments on that? I think um, I think a lot of you know what Vicky's just said I'm sure exists in, in a lot of the firms of some scale. I think there's a bigger challenge where 
you drop off your Deloitte's are a big machine. Um, you know, we're not not we're 500 people in the UK, so we're uh, we're big, but we're not where you are. And I think yeah. some of the challenges probably are, are, are more acute, depending on the scale of the business. Basically, um, you know, one of the one of the my huge bugbear at the moment around disruption, which is moving slightly off topic, is where you've got um, typically groups of, of men leaving bigger practices because bigger practices are responsible and bigger practices have maternity and bigger practices you know, do things properly and forming niche practices, which are typically, let's say, five to 10 guys who, who have worked out that they can earn 75p in the pound because they're not paying for maternity and they're not paying for all the things that responsible businesses have to put in place. And certainly, if there are any clients in the room or end users, I would ask you to really, really think very carefully about who your advisors are, in fact, and who you are using and, and who is behaving. And I know increasingly, when we present to large corporates, actually having sort of gender balance on your team is important, but also demonstrating that you don't just talk the talk, that you've actually, you live it and you've got all these bits in place, for me, would be, would be a really important initiative. Because I, I do think we're, we're playing sometimes on a very unfla- unfair playing field, yeah. if that makes sense. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask really unfairly, Kate, who I was talking to just before, can you just stick your hand up? Where are you, Kate? I know you're in the room. This lady here is a really great example of where I want to take the conversation next, which is basically about women returners. Um, and, and when you have that career break, um, how do you bring people back? This is a great lady who's looking for a job, employers in the room, so look out for her in a nice blue jacket. Um, because how do you get people um, in terms of, they have this career break, they've done some amazing things with their life and then they're looking to get back. And sometimes it's about how do you rebuild confidence, how do you kind of really step back into the workplace and what role does maybe blind CVs have in all of that? What should we be doing about people that have had that career break, maybe 5, 10, 15 years even, to kind of bring up the family, still got all the qualifications, how do they come back into the workplace? So we have a return to work programme which is aimed very much at people, so people applying for that programme must have been out of employment for at least two years. Um, Generally it's people who've been out of work because they've been doing, looking after children but they've kind of been looking after runners. To qualify for the programme you don't have to have been looking after children, you have to have been out of employment for at least two years. And um, it's a, and we run it and now a number, a number of other firms are running it and part of it is around putting people back into a work environment. It's, my understanding, it's a four day a week programme and one day a week of that is spent rebuilding some skills around confidence, how some of the working environment might have changed in a period of time. Three days is in a um, team environment working as a member of a team. And that's been very successful, around 80% I think of the people who've been through those programmes have decided to stay in full-time employment with us. And I mean we do it for a, a number of reasons, we do it because it's the right thing to do, one of the reasons we do it is it gives us access to a great talent pool that we wouldn't otherwise have access to. So a lot of this we do because we're a responsible firm and want to be seen to be doing the right thing. We also promote this agenda and are very committed to this agenda because it makes great sense because there are a number of people who've got great skills who have been out of employment for a while who can be a great asset to a team and if you give them that opportunity, you're probably likely to be much more loyal to you than someone who hasn't had that opportunity. So whilst we do it because we'd be good people, we also do it because it makes sense, because it gives us access to good people. And Bryony, I want to come to you about role modelling and mentoring and perhaps to just talk a little bit about how important that is. Um, I think the cohort that we have, which is the women of the future, both the winners and the runners up that really kind of come together as a group, it's one of the things actually that group itself is a really powerful network and I know there's a number of them in the room so hello to all of the the winners and runners up. Um, it's, It's really fantastic to have you here. But but what's the power of that? What does that really mean and, and the support that you get? So something that's been cropping up in my, in my head sort of throughout this panel session is about giving people time 
So we're all really, really busy in our day jobs. Um, it's, it's great to, to be here at this forum and to take the time out from that to sort of reflect on, on various things. And I think we don't give ourselves and we don't give line managers, we don't give um, people enough time to spend, to spend quality time with either their um, mentees or their teams. Um, and what, what I found really important from the, the group that we formed from uh, the awards is actually it's really important to take that time you know we don't we don't meet up that often but when we do we kind of spend a couple of hours um, together and it's a really big relief for me actually because you can sort of share stories share experiences yeah it's sort of chatham house rules so what 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 gets talked about in the room stays in the room um, and it gives everyone a bit of a support network um, particularly given where we are in our careers i think um, just to just to be reassured that maybe it's not just you that's feeling that frustration or it's not just you that's had that incident or it's not just you that's just thinking about well is this really the right thing for me to be doing am i in the right industry and i know in you know in the last couple of years i've had a few moments of thinking oh should i really be doing this is it, you know it, it's really hard work is this what i want to be doing um, but actually having that group um, with the rscs support has been really valuable to me around mm -hmm. that um, and also it's helped me find wider networks um, within the industry um, so it doesn't just stop with sort of our, our kind of collective as such so that's something that's really what important. What about mentoring and coaching in that Bryony? What, what role does that have? So um, for me it's, it's, it's fantastic to have the reach out to people um, to, to kind of just take a bit of time to think about what you're doing and am I on the right path um, and I've got Tim here, who uh, Tim Neal in the room, who very kindly offered to be a mentor for me, along with Amanda as well. And actually, that's great because I think I said earlier, you have to own your own career, um, and no one's going to kind of pave the way for you. Um, and having access to real role models in the industry is something that's really important. I don't think we've got enough real role models. Um, and I think I've said before, actually, that you're not just going to find one role model that's going to tick all the boxes for you. And what makes a good role model? What makes a good role model? Well, that depends. It depends on what point in your career you're at. It depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for someone who's going to really give you a big push to get to the next level, or if you're looking for someone who's just actually going to listen a bit to some of the things that are worrying you, if you're looking for someone that's going to get you out of a bit of a, a bit of a ditch, if you're looking for someone that's just going to give you a bit of a pep up, it depends what you're looking for. And I think there's a different role between maybe a mentor and a sponsor. Um, but it, it's about talking to people sometimes about your worries. And I think as women, we don't necessarily talk about the things that are worrying us. Mm -hmm. And because we don't give maybe our line managers enough time to spend with some of their teams, they maybe don't appreciate that, that maybe that woman who is kind of at the midpoint of her career is really struggling and just wants someone to kind of go, well, you were right. And it's at that point that women start to maybe look elsewhere, you know, whether they've gone away to have children or whether they're just at the point in their career where they're struggling to get to the next level. I and mean, actually, by the time that they hand their resignation in, it's too late. So we need to give people time to have those conversations. I'm going to ask for some audience participation now. So hands up, who has a uh, mentor in the room? Quite a high proportion, maybe 50%. So pretty good. Get used to putting your hands up because I'm going to be coming to you for some questions in a moment. But before I do, Simon, just to pick up on maybe part of that package is, again, about the workplace and setting the scene around maybe flexible working, the whole wellness agenda as, as a means to actually kind of keeping people um, within, within the workplace. And also just thinking about... Um, you know, what kind of networks should organisations actually be set up, whether it's returning mums or mid-career, or how does networks really help as well? Well, just just quick question on the or statement on the role model thing, because it's quite an interesting one. So, so I have a fantastic colleague who sits on the board with me. Um, she, is, she is a top talent in, in, the, in the industry. And when I was sitting in front of a, a group of younger uh, female colleagues recently, you know, I held her out to be a fantastic role model for, for, for the business. And I got some really interesting feedback, thinking that everyone would go, yeah, that's, that's, she's amazing, she's fantastic. They actually said, she is fantastic and she's inspirational, but I'm not sure she's a good role model. And I tried to sort of dig down as to, to why that was. And, and the analysis was that, you know, she was absolutely brilliant, top of her game, um, two children, but, but lived in Islington, sort of 15 minutes from, from, from the office, so could be home, 
could afford to have amazing childcare, had a super successful husband, and and clearly, you know, had this amazing affluent lifestyle that that, that went with the kids and, 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 and the whole piece. And they said, that's not us, actually, that's not where we are. We, we, we don't live in Islington, and my husband's a policeman, and so she's, she's sort of inspirational and aspirational, but actually she's not a great role model because that's not the sort of reality of, of the situation. So I think you've got to be really, really careful about putting people on pedestals and saying, this is this, your point, Barony, is about this, this something different for everyone. Um, and, and it was a real lesson to me just in, in understanding that what I thought was really great and amazing, the reality was that that wasn't the reality, if that, if that makes sense. So that, that was a really interesting lesson. And the power of networks maybe in there, is And there? then, well, we, you know, as I said, 10 years ago, we went out of our way to recruit more, more women. More women in the business meant that you had sort of, I'm gonna call it female power networking at different generations. Um, and, and we have, we have mentoring, I think, the young ladies that, that, that work for me there will put their hands up, I'm pleased to see, thank, thank, thank you, thank you. Um, <laughs> I was really worried for a minute. Um, and um, so, so we, and we, we subscribe to the various sort of industry networks. I do have a, a bit of an issue with the, the industry networks, and I've, I've tried to sort of broker this as a, as a sort of bit of an offering. So we have women in leadership, women in property, women in real estate, and I, I do think that the, the, it would be much more powerful if, if those groups came together because at the moment they're fairly disparate and, and I appreciate someone has set these up and I know many of the people who've set them up and, and, and done great stuff with them but, but I do think that it would be better if we had a single stronger voice for, for women in the industry rather than two or three different voices that, that, that are great but have the same agenda basically. So I'd like to see some changes, changes there. Let's come to the audience. Um, does anybody have a question for our panel? Yes. Um, so we met recently. Yes. If, you, if you could say who you are and where you're from. Yeah, so <coughs> yeah, it's just coming, just coming, the mic's just coming. Bear with us a second. Just one second, Victoria, it's there. So, um, name is Vicky Williams. I work freelance, but I'm ex Big Four. Um, Amanda, we met recently. Hold your mic up. Um, we met recently, so you'll understand. Um, so, I came out of Big Four um, at a time of marriage breakdown, and for the last four to six years, I've worked in quite high profile contract roles. Project work is quite familiar for a lot of the women that I've spoken to around the room. I'm now at a family <coughs> position where I'm looking to re enter back into corporates. On my own, although I work at senior levels and the clients appreciate the work I do, I can't fulfil potential. Um, now, I can't get past HR departments in both Deloitte, both Arcadus. Amanda, you're slightly different because I approached you direct. I don't fall into return to work. Um, I fall into senior levels. Um, but the door's closed. So I guess the question in that is how do you break through? It's almost like a, <coughs> a vertical glass ceiling rather than a, a horizontal one. Thoughts on that? Maybe Vicky, one for you, Deloitte. Um, how do you break through? Uh, and applying for senior roles is always difficult, whatever background you come from, and there's got to be able, the ability to be able to match um, the supply and demand at that point in time. And we generally try not to recruit at a senior level, so we t try to recruit at a junior level and grow the teams through the business. So we have very few senior roles that we would be looking to fill externally um, but I'm not sure if I was thinking about that that I would be going through HR departments because in all big organisations I'm sure all of ours are very similar they are following a process they're looking for whether people meet specific criteria I think it's around identifying opportunities yourself and, and contacting people which a lot of people do and I guess one of the things that sometimes applies to women is that women can be less confident in doing that than men so we get all kinds of random approaches from people from men who are completely unqualified <laughs> for lots of jobs and it doesn't stop them applying trying to contact us pursuing us now if we don't have the opportunity for them it doesn't ultimately lead to success but I, it is one of the areas where I am often quite surprised by the pushiness of some of 
our male colleagues and the lack of pushiness of some of our females in the industry. Keep, keep pushing, I think, is the yeah. message there and using the networks. Can, let's pick another question. Um, yeah, go on. Just wait for the mic, just, just bear with us one second. Hi, it's Amy Leader and I work for the St Edmundsbury Borough Council. Um, really, in my experience, I'm a mother of two, um, 15 and 12, so things have changed, they still have a way to go. But my challenge would actually be more about making it an equal platform for everyone. Um, my experience has been that my partner, when he's asked for flexibility, has had no. So actually, whilst there is an element of um, women being supported, I also think there's a challenge there for, for men to be supported as well. Great, great question, Amy. Thank you. Simon, do you want to pick that one up in terms of what's the role for, for men and actually men being perhaps braver to, to ask for maybe sort of work, work, different working arrangements to help support Yeah, I, 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 well, I think things are changing as, as women become more empowered in the, in the workplace um, and, and increasingly take, you know, really progressive high earning roles so they become in, in many cases the major breadwinner which is quite often the case in, in my firm uh, you know I think we we will see um, an inevitability a great great greater flexibility it's uh, it, part of the frustration here is I think we're all on the same page the issue is getting there and how quickly we, we can get there your point there has been change but there's, there's still a long way to go and I think that's that's spot on it's just how quickly we can get there but I I think the joint, joint flexibility, uh, paternity, maternity, is an absolute inevitability if the trajectory that society is on continues and, and women become more empowered in the workplace. Great. There are some more questions over in that corner. Um, <coughs> lady just at the back there. Sorry, is that Lorna? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Hi, uh, Lorna Walker here from CBRE. Um, yeah, it's been really interesting hearing about um, some of the different sort of initiatives and things that um, you all have going on. Um, I'd just be interested to know, do each of you have one thing that if you could take this action next as a piece of practical action that you think would help improve the retention of uh, women either in your company or in the industry more general, generally? You've be really my last question, yeah. Laura. Sorry. No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a really good one, though. Come on, what one thing would you... you what advice would you be giving to, let's take it from an employer perspective at this point of view, Vicky? Uh, so I think what we, and when I say I think society generally needs to get much better at, and I see this at Deloitte, is that ability to get behind people's personal circumstances, have those honest conversations, understand what people want to get out of their career at a point in time, what is possible for them, what is not possible, and put together a package that works. And I think also recognise that those requirements change over time mm. and give people the opportunity to switch into different environments as their requirements change. But I think it comes back to training people, which is very difficult for a lot of people because people can have had long careers where they haven't had these type of conversations to, to you know spend time and get behind what works for the organization what works for the individual and how to put that together yeah Bryony um, so a bit back to my um, concept around giving people time um, I think something that came up yesterday in the forum was that we in the industry we we keep doing things the way we've always done things and actually that's not working anymore in terms of innovation but also in terms of creating a diverse workforce. Um, I think we need to take a step back and um, give people a bit more time to focus on their teams, to really focus on their people um, and to create a bit of an even platform for men and for women. And there's an awful lot of pressure on people at the moment in terms of performance at work. Um, we're all, you know, we're all here to make money at the end of the day, we have to make the businesses work and I think we understand that but at the same time you're only as good as the people that you've got um, and I think if you can create a really collaborative, fun, motivating place to work, that's going to be attractive to men and women. Simon, anything to add to that? I, I think I don't have one thing. I, I, my, my, my big thing would, would it's not just a, a gender and a women thing, it, it's a social diversity thing. Mm. I would like to, to pick talent from a much deeper pool. And I think that, that would have long-term 
benefits for our industry and I, and I think it would, it would change people, the people coming into the industry, the, perhaps the social demographic and I think that would make it easier in some respects for a more balanced workforce. I have a question from the back from our president, John Hughes. John. Yes, I wonder, uh, it's very interesting listening to people who are in the workforce here or in, in the industry. I'm actually interested to see whether any of the panel has a, a view as to, well, question one, whether we need to sort of supercharge um, the change because our industry is still hugely uh, male-oriented. And so the question is, do we really need to actually do anything? more to actually drive that. And I'm wondering also, in particular, niches within the industry are far more male dominated than others. And is that something that is a concern? Should we be trying to do something about that? And, and I think perhaps on that, almost what would be the message for RICS? You know, what would you want to see RICS doing to, to address John's point? Vicky. And, I, and this is very much a personal view for myself, but I think, you know, life has changed, things have got better, but we all need to acknowledge we are far from where we should be mm. on social mobility, on all aspects of diversity, on women, you know, so Deloitte has a target of getting 25% of partners to be female. And I think if you turn that around, you could say, but that is accepting that 75% of our leadership is going to be men. And I think if we changed the question that we ask ourselves and just say, let's stop talking about things getting better, let's just think about what is the place that we want to be, and if we're not there, let's continue to get there. Yeah. I think, you know, lots of good effort, lots of interventions, but let's call out the fact that there are some organisations, some parts of the industry, which are just so far off being acceptable that that should be called out. And Brian, you talked personally from sort of like your mm. early career and you know kind of what you needed to you needed to adapt. What message would you want to see for RICS to perhaps address some of those areas like construction where if we looked at the percentage of qualified females it's actually it's much lower. What do we need to be doing? I think we need to be thinking big. I think we need to be um, you know it's not all about targets or quotas but actually that's a step in the right direction. I'm, I'm not a big believer in saying let's get X number of people on boards, but actually we've tried doing it the soft way and it's just not working quick mm. enough. Um, I think if we set ourselves targets, if we hit them, great, but actually let's, let's, do, some, let's do some really ambitious targets and let's push ourselves a bit harder because I think, I think we can all be working a bit better at this as a diversity agenda. So not just male, female, but also a wider kind of um, diverse workforce. Um, and that would be really inspirational, I think, for, our, for RICS to kind of set the tone with that across the industry. And actually, there are some pretty shocking um, data facts out there, some pretty shocking anecdotes that I've heard that still happen in the industry. So let's, let's get those on the table, let's address those, and let's use those to, as a platform to, to really make a big change. And Simon, maybe from your perspective, what would you like to see RICS doing on this to pick up on John? Well, one, I, I think we are in a more supercharged environment, sort of post Weinstein, post President's Club. I think if these, with hindsight, if we look back and these moments in time, you know, are, are great sort of instigators of speeding up change. I think that, that, that could be a positive that comes out of a really negative situation. So I think, I think things, things are moving quicker than they ever have done, which is really, really good. In terms of the, the support from, from the RICS, I mean, Sean, Matt, Gillian, they, they know where the Windsor Group are on this. They're, this is this is absolutely front and central. Uh, you know, we are we are connecting with you on, on a regular basis, uh, and I think cumulatively, there's an absolute genuine desire to, to get there as quickly as we can. It, it's not just a gender thing, though. As I said, it, it's a it's a wider piece than that. Um, but I, I would I would certainly if. You know, I was sitting where Sean is over there. I, I, this would be absolutely front and central for me. This is, this is one of the big things. Can we talk about gender pay gap? Um, I don't think we can be sort of sitting here at this particular point in April where all of the firms have had to publish their gender pay gaps. What's the impression, and Bryony, I'm going to come from you because I know that network group had kind of a reaction to um, certainly President's Club and also sort of gender pay gap. What's your sense on what that means, particularly for those people that are mid-career? Because that's, that's been quite a, um, a wake-up call, I think. 
yeah, it's it's not something that you can that you can ignore seeing. You know, it's quite it's quite a black and white sort of um, data representative of of where we are in the industry. <coughs> I think my concern is that now that that's out there as such, um, I know businesses are trying to manage the the fallout of that. Is that it makes it really visible for women to see actually how. I'm going to use the word undervalued, maybe they are in 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 the industry, mm. um, and that's not overly motivating. I think we'd probably all agree on that one. Um, and I think my concern is that we don't have a lot of visible um, women leaders in the industry, um, and unless there's a change to make that gender pay gap less of a gap and more balanced, women are going to be looking elsewhere um, in other industries potentially. Um, because why would they stay somewhere where they don't feel adequately su supported, where they don't feel that they're valued, and where they're not both motivated anymore? It's you know, it's it's just not. It's it's kind of like a, an easy decision to make. So I think we need to be doing more to uh, retain women, which is why we're here this morning, um, to support them and to make sure that they're that everything is equal um, between men and women. There are some other questions up at the back there. If not, I'm going to come to the front. Let's come to the front. Just here, lady in the grey suit. Hi there, I'm Joan Farnsworth, um, Commercial Manager for Gantford Tri, also known as Mrs FQS. Um, just, a, just a quick question, um, what is the, the RSCS, the 14% of females, do we understand how many of those 14% are actually still practicing and working? I, I, I probably, or Barry, do you want to pick that one up or I can answer yeah, it? So that 14% that is um, people working in the industry is a as a whole, um, as Amanda mentioned, um, the trainees number is showing you know, a, a lot of progression. It's actually around 27% for new, um, newly qualified and enrolled female members. So there is a, certainly a, an upward trend in that respect, but it is that exactly what we're talking about today. It's, it's the, the middle career that we see that drop off. And there's a lady just behind you for a, a question, if we can pick that one up. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, Maisha, I'm from the University of Salford. Just speaking about um, diversity and bringing talent in, there are so many international students who are studying in the builder environment, but we don't really have the opportunity to apply for jobs here. Small to medium companies are not interested in sponsoring us, even though the process is not that difficult. And some of the multinational companies are wonderful, but there's so many of them who won't even accept applications just because you don't have the permanent right to work, which is something that they could do. But my question is, why aren't they? Good question. Who wants to take that one? Well, it's a good question. I, I, we, we do sponsor students uh, from overseas, but I have to say the government could make it a lot easier for us in terms of sorting out visas and, you know, sort of permanent work. So. Uh, I, I, it's, a, almost a, it's almost a sort of whether RICS connect with government to make to, to sort of smooth that process because it's difficult. Certainly in my experience, it's difficult. I'm going to take one last question just from the back there, gentlemen. Blue shirt, thank you. Uh, Mike Holden, uh, North Lancashire, uh, Yorkshire Dales area. I take up the point uh, that a uh, colleague uh, from Salford University, University of Salford, sorry, uh, made before about taking people on uh, who are international. We have a uh, student who's Polish who uh, has a PhD and we've welcomed her into the practice. So not all small practices are like that. Okay. Just wait for the mic, just wait for the mic, sorry. Um, I do know that there are some companies that I've heard of who have actively gone and sponsored students and I've been very lucky because I've been, I'm sponsored by Atkins now, I will be, but there are so many people who have to leave the country even if they don't want to and I think it's such a shame because they're really good people. So. Yeah, absolutely. I'm conscious of time, we're in our last five minutes. I wanted to come to um, each of the panel in a moment and just ask you about a message for the room. So I'm gonna kind of come back to you in a second. Before I do, I've got one final question from the floor, lady over on my right. Hi there, my name's Philippa Stratford. I work with Transport for London. Um, I have a two-year-old and my husband and I have a very fine balanced childcare arrangement. Um, my question really is about, and we're talking about mid-career, my concern is that um, because of our very fine balanced childcare arrangements, the lack of um, um, uh, other support networks, 
I have to leave the office at four o'clock. If I don't, I get penalised by the childcare arranger and um, financial components and all, all kinds of um, issues. My worry is that my visibility in the office is not uh, is going to hold back my development in terms of career progression. Um, I'm in at 7.30 in the morning, so I'm in often before all of my colleagues, but often it's the guys who are there late at night, keep working um, through, are seen as giving it the most and, um, and are, are getting those opportunities. What can we do to accommodate um, that kind okay. of issue? I'm sure it must be broad for a lot of people um, with their childcare. And, may and maybe that's sort of touching on that flexible working point as well, Simon. I think it's just, to be honest, <laughs> With my people that I work with, it's just about productivity. Mm. It's, I, 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 frankly, you could be in my office two days a week. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't care if, if, if the productivity is there. So it's measuring productivity is the key thing, not being at your desk at seven o'clock at night. That might be because you're inefficient, actually. So yeah. I, I really, really, really feel that, that you've just got to be productive and you will be, or you should be, if your employer's on, on point on this, you should be rewarded for productivity. And I was kind of smiling because even with a 17-year-old and an 11-year-old, my childcare arrangements are always very fine-tuned. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can't imagine a time when they ever won't be. And I'm, never, I'm always the person running up the road from the tube station to get home on time. And, and that, I think, kind of goes with the terrace tray. Um, but one of the big trends I've seen over recent times is a move towards agile working, more flexible ways of working, people working from home, people working at different times. And so one of the things I would urge you to be is not to be nervous about the fact that you are maybe working different hours from some of your colleagues and to be as vocal as they are about what you are delivering, the output, and kind of don't be underconfident because you've got different arrangements you know, talk about your achievements, talk about what you've done. And I'm sorry, child cares like that, it carries on for a long time. <laughs> okay, let's, one message to the room. We've got a fantastically mixed audience here. If you could give one message to this room from this subject, what would it be, Simon? I, I would keep, keep faith. I, I really feel change is coming. How quickly we get there, you know, is, is probably down to us and, and people beyond this room but but I would keep the faith because I, I do think the path we're on is is the right path thank you Bryony uh, I think it's I think a message for women is to keep shouting about our achievements make sure people know what you're doing um, and make sure that you are expanding your networks building allies in the networks um, and getting people to champion yourself as well. So if you're not, you know, if you're not in the office all day, because most of us aren't anymore actually, there's someone, there's always someone there that's going to make sure that your name's put forward for maybe the next promotion or the next role. Thank and you. I would Thank build you. on that. And I think firms are, are doing a lot and moving things forward. But what we should all be doing is being very confident, uh, talking about our achievements, and deciding what we want from our careers at different points in our lives and pushing forward and delivering on that ourselves and be demanding of our colleagues to deliver on it for us. Great. This is very much about the continuation of the conversation. As Gillian said at the start, there'll be more in this, if you like, series to, to follow. So really um, stay, stay involved. Please do engage with um, our ICS as we kind of take this agenda forward. But for now, can I thank Vicky, Bryony and Simon for joining me on stage. Thank you.